بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. My teacher and my sheikh and my mentor, um, who passed away about four years ago, his teacher and his mentor shared a reflection. And he's written it in his work as well, Ma'arif al-Sunan, which is his commentary on the book of Hadith by Imam al-Tirmidhi, the Jami' of al-Tirmidhi. He shares this reflection within, that, within his writing. That we, we learn from the Qur'an, this is alluded to in the Qur'an, where the Prophet Isa alayhi salam is quoted as saying, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Sorry, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمَ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ And then he goes on to tell them, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِي إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ that he tells them that the Prophet, the messenger that will come after me will be Ahmad. And of course, referring to the Prophet ﷺ. And then we have it in an authentic narration that's found in Sahih Bukhari and other places in which the Prophet ﷺ confirms for us that there were no prophets or messengers that were sent between Isa ﷺ and the Prophet ﷺ. There were no prophets sent during that time. And what we generally know from the history and the, you know, kind of record keeping of the world at that time is about six centuries passed, almost six centuries passed between Isa alayhi salam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 600 years. And because there were no prophets and messengers for 600 years, humanity fell to its lowest point. Now someone may wonder, well it's been 1400 years since the Prophet ﷺ, but the difference is that we have the Qur'an. And th that, those people, those generations, they did not have something like the Qur'an. The revelation, the text, the scripture was not preserved for them the way the Qur'an has been preserved for us. The Qur'an in fact tells us They altered a lot of it and they omitted huge chunks of it. So now, do the now let's get back to the facts here. So six centuries, 600 years, no prophets, no messengers and no preserved scripture. So because of that kind of deprivation, humanity sunk to its lowest point. The lowest point in human history was the day before the Prophet ﷺ was born. That was the lowest point in human history. And when you read in, even in the Qur'an itself and what it describes about them, it, it becomes very evident. These were people one narration of Sahih Bukhari, the Sahabi after becoming Muslim is reflecting on his life before Islam. And he says, do you know what life was like? We would be worshipping a rock. I would have a rock at home that I would worship. And one day, while coming home from work, I would see a nicer, shinier rock, a cooler looking rock, and I would take it, dust it off, take it home, throw the other rock out, and put it there and start worshipping it. There is nothing lower. Think about what the condition of humanity is. And the Quran tells us how they killed each other. And they murdered each other for the smallest, you know, things that they interpreted as slights or disrespect. They would bury their own daughters alive. So humanity had sunk to its lowest point. And when at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed to reveal his speech into this world. When Allah opened the gates of the heavens and spoke into this world once again, after six centuries, 
to bring humanity from the darkness back into the light. The very first word that Allah spoke into this world, the very first word that He revealed was Iqra, was read. And so the teacher of my teacher, Alama Yusuf bin Nuri rahmallahu ta'ala, he writes that it is not a coincidence, we believe there's no coincidence, that the very first word of revelation was read. And that right there is the significance and the importance of knowledge. That knowledge and learning and understanding will always be the pathway to bringing humanity from the depths of darkness and deprivation to the peaks of enlightenment and illumination. And we have to empower ourselves with that understanding and that knowledge of our deen, of our religion. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about How do, how do we go about this? How do we exactly go about this? So there's a couple of narrations. Number one, there's a few narrations rather. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ says an authentic narration from Ibn Majah, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ The seeking of knowledge is a requirement and mandatory upon every Muslim, every believer. So number one, you have to want it. Knowledge will not come to you. And that's why the, there are many aphorisms of the early generations of Muslims. One of them they would say, Knowledge is, you go to knowledge, it does not come to you. And this is not to put anyone or anything on a pedestal. We're not talking about that people of knowledge are too good to go to anyone. That's not the point. It's talking about the knowledge itself. To the point where the person of knowledge could come to you and could knock your door. They could bang your door down. But if you don't want it, if you don't, you're not seeking it, you're not motivated for it, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And that's why, right, um, there was a famous scholar in the subcontinent. Uh, he wrote a translation of the Quran. Um, he wrote a translation of Sahih Bukhari. And a very prolific scholar, a remarkable person. His name was Ahmad Ali Lahori. And he was born into a Sikh family. Right? His parents were Sikh. They were not Muslim. And he sometimes in his later years, where he would give durus in the masjid, he would reflect on this. And he would say that how strange is Allah's decree. How fascinating. Where he would say that you have people walking around here today and they were born into the homes of Muslims and even born into the homes of, of scholarly people who don't know anything about their religion. And someone else can be born into the home of non-Muslims and now be in a position to teach other people. And so there's no guarantees. The child of the scholar could know nothing. And the child of a non-Muslim could be the teacher of a generation. And so the very first thing is, I have to want it. Talab. I have to be seeking it. I have to want it. And I guess coming to a 10 a.m. session on a Sunday does count for something, right? It's seeking it at some level. So that's something that I want everyone to really think about. You have to desire it, you have to want it, you have to be motivated for it. Number two, in another narration, the Prophet ﷺ, he says, Knowledge is sought through learning. 
Now that seems like an obvious statement, right? Knowledge is sought or knowledge is through learning. But think about it, it's saying something very profound. That unless I commit to the exercise and the process of learning, the rigor of learning, I can't, I can't know something. And we live so much in this, we live in this era, the age of information. But maybe knowledge has, knowledge has never been more scarce. And that's the irony of it. How can you be in the age of information and have such little knowledge as a civilization? Well, because information is easy. The goal and the objective with information is to make it as easy as possible. Information, the easier, it, the more easily it is acquired, the more praiseworthy it is. Right? So I've created this system that is just amassing data and information. With one click of a button, that's a good thing in information. When you're dealing in information and data, you want to achieve as much as you can with as little work as possible. Knowledge, the more work that is put into it, the more praiseworthy it is. Knowledge, the more effort, the more work that's involved, the better it is. And it's not about the outcome and the results, which is, which is exactly why the Prophet ﷺ in the authentic narration, he says that مَنْ قَرَأَ الْقُرْآنَ وَيُتَعَتِعُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقٌ فَلَهُ أَجَرَانٌ The Prophet ﷺ says that somebody who learns or reads the Qur'an is trying to learn the Qur'an and it's, he is struggling in doing it. He or she is tripping and falling and struggling. And it's so difficult. That person gets double the reward. Because that was the actual goal. You know those things where we talk about it's not about the end, it's about the means. It's about the journey, not the destination. It's about the process, not the outcome. That exactly is the case when it comes to knowledge. It's all about the journey. It's all about the process. It's all about the exercise. One of my, and I'm going to say this, and it, you know, it's kind of, it might sound a little corny, but I mean it in all genuine sense. One of my greatest role models when it comes to learning is my mother. Very, very simple lady. My father, may Allah have mercy upon him, he passed away last year. He was like an intellectual. He was a mathematician. Like literally, he just did math because he enjoyed it. All right? Um, and was very, you know, just sophisticated that way. My mother, who is amazing and a hard-working person, but is very simple when it comes to these, like math and all this, She's like, I don't know all this. I don't care about it. And my mom has been trying to learn, like, Quranic Arabic for as long as I can remember. She's been on that journey for most of my life. And so much so that even now, every Tuesday evening, she attends her Quranic Arabic class every Tuesday. And, you know, she's a lot older now, and so it's a little bit harder for her to get around and move around. So I always make sure that I, I'm there and I take her and I sit her down. Um, and the teacher, who's one of our students, always freaks out every time she sees me in the classroom. It's like, and I said, no, I'm not here for you. You do your thing, right? I'm here for my mom. So I make sure she gets seated with her water and everything like that. And then I come and, you know, and she tells me last week, as I'm dropping her off at home, she's like, um, do you have time tomorrow? I said, yeah, sure, of course. What do you need? 
And I think, you know, she's like, oh, I need you to come fix the sink. I need you to go buy some milk. I need you, well, I, I figure something like that. And she's like, I need you to come and help me with my homework, right? I, I'm not getting it. I'm not getting it, right? And the reason why I say, right, this isn't some amazing story of somebody who wrote a tafsir of the Quran. Who knows? But I just don't see the trajectory. I'm being honest with you. All right? Who knows? But I don't see it. Um, but the reason why I call her a role model is because she's still seeking it. It's the exercise. She spent her whole life trying to learn a little bit of Quranic, Arabic language, grammar, vocab. And that's the goal. That's the goal. We're a product of this culture. I was talking about the culture that we're a product of today, that we are products of today. I talked about the age of information. Uh, the other thing that's an unfortunate kind of reality of our culture today is the issue of expediency, convenience. We're trying to make everything faster, easier. Knowledge isn't supposed to be faster and easier. It's not supposed to be. I remember even when, you know, we were starting out with um, putting together the seminary in Dallas at Qalam, and there were a lot of discussions about, you know, what's realistic, what's not realistic, can people study for this long or that long or do this much or this many days a week and this many months a year, and a lot of discussions. And of course, you know, I don't know nothing. I went and I spoke to my teachers and my shiuch and I consulted with them. And basically, the conclusion we came to is, well, this is what is, this is what it takes. It is what it is. And we can't compromise on that. Now, there needs to be different options available for people in different situations in life. But the one thing that will be true across the board is you're going to have to put the work in. You got to learn. You got to put in that sweat equity. It's all sweat equity. You don't even need two nickels to run, rub together to seek knowledge. But, all, but you do need that hard work. So first of all, you got to be internally motivated. Have that talab, that himma. And number two, you got to put the work in. It's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. And Allah does say in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنَ لِلذِّكْرِ So it is easy. But what that means is that it's not something that is unattainable or unachievable. Allah will facilitate it for you, but you're still going to have to put the work in. And it can be, it doesn't have to be necessarily the quantity of the work, but it is the quality of the work. Consistency. Consistency. And there's another narration that's in the book of Abu Dawood, even though Asah Mawqufan, it's more authentic as a statement of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, but it's mentioned in the book of Abu Dawood from the Prophet sallallahu And that is a very fascinating narration. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, um, Qayyidu al-ilma bil kitaba. Trap knowledge by writing it down. Trap knowledge by writing it down. And the reason why I bring up this particular narration is there are certain, there is a certain etiquette and there is a certain system to seeking knowledge. And you have to comply with the etiquette and the system. I'm going to say this, no one is going to reinvent seeking knowledge. In fact, if somebody ever tells you that they've revolutionized, reinvented, reimagined, and revolutionized seeking knowledge, my recommendation is run. Because <laughs> you do not want any part of that. There, is been, there has been a system and a methodology from the Prophet ﷺ. All the way till today. And so, again, put in the work, be ambitious, have himma, dream big. Put in the work, be consistent, 
and then follow the proper system and the methodology. And if we do that, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will enlighten us with knowledge. Now I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes talking about what exactly, where do we start? Because again, a lot of times when we talk about knowledge, we just keep talking about knowledge, 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 and it just sounds like this big mountain of a thing. So what is the practical aspect of starting? So there is a prioritization of seeking knowledge. And the Prophet ﷺ gave us that prioritization. He said, تَرَكْتُ فِيكُمْ أَمْرَيْنَ لَن تَضِلُّ مَا تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا Kitab Allah wa sunnah al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said, I leave you with two resources. You will not go astray. You shall not lose your way so long as you hold on to these two things. And what are those two things? The book of Allah, the Quran, and the way of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, when we talk about the Quran and when we talk about the sunnah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that itself is a huge endeavor. And that involves a lot of things. Right? Because if we talk about learning the Quran, are we talking about the vocabulary? Are we talking about the grammar? Are we talking about the balagha, the eloquence? Are we talking about the recitation and the different modes of recitation, the qira'at and the riwayat? Are we talking about the tafsir and the in-depth analysis? And then what kind of tafsir? Tafsir bil ma'thur, tafsir by narration, tafsir bil diraya, analytical tafsir, or are we talking about tafsir bil ishara, reflective tafsir, right? And the list goes on and on and on. And if we talk about the sunnah, then what again what are we talking about? Are we talking about mutunul hadith, the the basic, the, the, the more smaller, concise collections of hadith? Are we talking about the sunan, the expansive compilations, the jawamiya, the authoritative compilations? Are we talking about the meaning of the, of, the, of the narrations themselves? Are we talking about the historicity, the history behind the hadith? Are we talking about dirayatul hadith? Are we talking about at-takhrij wal-asanid, the chains of narrations and the analysis of that? al all the people who have narrated the hadith and their biographies like what are we talking about that's a whole lot so I'd like to and again at some level it'll depend on different people and where they are in their journey but I'm going to make a more general recommendation that is applicable to everybody in this room number one we start with the Quran the Prophet ﷺ said, I leave you with the Qur'an. So we start with the Qur'an. And what is the primary thing that I will recommend to start with when it comes to the Qur'an? Read the translation of the Qur'an, cover to cover. Read the translation of the Qur'an from cover to cover. And have your translation, a written copy, if again, you kind of got to read it uh, on the go, and so you're reading it through an app, I guess that's okay. My recommendation would be to have like a physical copy where you are then writing down any questions that come up. Highlight and underline sections, passages where you didn't understand what it was saying. So that if and when the opportunity presents itself and then you find a person of knowledge, you're able to say, hey, can you explain this to me? Can you answer this for me? But make it a mission and a goal that I will not stop until I complete the entire reading of the translation of the Quran from cover to cover. And there's many, many different translations that one can read from, right? The translation of the Noble Quran by Marmaduke Pictal. One of my personal favorites, it's not for everybody, it's written in Old English. Um, or the translation of Professor Abdul Halim. Or the translation of Professor Ahmad Zaki Hamad, the gracious Quran. There's a number of them. And start there. Now, I'll give you step two in case maybe someone says that's something I've started or I've done. I'll go ahead and give you step two. And then I'll move on to the next major area. Step two, I will say, is a lot of times we hear, learn the language of the Qur'an, learn the Arabic language. And while that's important, let me qualify that. Learn the vocabulary of the Qur'an. Learn Qur'anic vocabulary. 
Learning Quranic, Arabic, grammar and language and syntax and morphology, a, a stage comes for that. But you'll know when you're there. And a teacher will guide you to that and through that. But this next step, if you've completed the reading of the translation of the Quran, the next step is learn Quranic vocabulary. I know it sounds simple, like vocab, really? Like flashcards? Right? Vocab, really? Yes, vocab, really. Because you know what's going to happen? Day one, you're going to learn three, three words. Thalika, or, or, or we'll say four or five words. Thalika, al-kitabu, la rayba, fihi. Thalika, that. Kitab, book, la raib, la means no, raib means doubt, fi means it, he means it. That book, no doubt in it. Now understand every single time those words come again, you, you have some idea of what it's talking about. And if you learned one vocabulary word a day, See, that's the other thing. Shaitan, you got to keep on learning. Shaitan gets in our head and says, oh, big deal, you learned one word. You're never going to learn anything. After a year, inshallah, if we're still alive and we see each other next year here at Ikna, remember at that time, I'll make eye contact with you to make you uncomfortable. It's been one year, 365 days. And that could have been 365 words of the Quran that you would understand. But what you did was, you psyched yourself out. And you gave in to the weakness. And you got nothing to show for it. So learn Quranic vocabulary after completing the reading of the translation of the Quran. The second area the Prophet ﷺ advises for is the way of the Prophet ﷺ, the life, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And like I said, that's a really big, huge topic. It's impossible to, you know, encompass all of it. So where's the starting point? The starting point is what we call the seerah, the prophetic biography, the life and times of the Prophet ﷺ. Learn the seerah, read the seerah, listen to the seerah. Start somewhere. Start with the seerah podcast on the Qalam podcast. Just start there. Just start listening to it. Go through it, one after another. While you're going to school, driving to work, picking up the kids, washing the dishes, working out, whatever it is. And then preferably, go down to the bazaar, find a, a book on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, the seerah, the sealed nectar, a prophet of mercy, Couple of recommendations, sealed nectar, Rahiqul Maktum by Alama Bumbarak Puri Rahmullah Ta'ala, great scholar of hadith in India of the past generation. Or there's Prophet of Mercy, beautiful translation of Nabiul Rahma, a beautiful seed of the Prophet Sallallahu written by a philosopher and a great scholar of India of the previous century. I had the honor and the pleasure of meeting him, Abu Hassan Ali and Nadwi Rahmullah. But go and buy that book of the Sila and read through it. But read and learn the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And it will be game changer. And I'm over my time. But I'm going to end. And I talked about this last night. Uh, while we were having a little get together at the Qalam booth. So if you were there, I apologize. It will be a repeat for you. But I just want to end on this story. So that it's a bit uplifting. Stop underestimating yourselves. The Prophet said, do not underestimate the opportunity to do good. Stop underestimating yourselves. Last night I was sharing the story of Al-Qa'nabi. He is one of the most illustrious people of knowledge of the early generations. He is one of the most authoritative students of Imam Malik. And he was one of the teachers of Imam Bukhari. His name is all over the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, Al Qa'nabi. What is who is Al Qa'nabi? What's his story? His story was that he was a troublemaker, a criminal on the streets of Baghdad, and he used to drink and harass people. He was literally like a thug in the streets. And one day, a great scholar of Hadith in Baghdad, Shu'bah. He was a student of the Tabi'un and 
even, you know, of the Kibaru Tabi'un. And he was going and he was teaching, going with the students. Students were with him and he was going to teach hadith. And Al Qa'nabi sees him and then just making trouble. He blocks him in the street and he said, Where are you going? Who are you? Why are these people with you? And he says, My name is Shu'ba. And he starts mocking him. Where's Shu'ba? What's a Shu'ba? And then one of the students who gets irritated says, Wa muhaddith. He's a teacher of hadith. And he says, Oh, really? Teacher of hadith? Wow. He says, Hadithni. Teach me some hadith. And the narration describes he was wearing red colored, like lower garment, a red izar, like red pants, and he had no shirt on. And he had a dagger tucked in right here, like he had his gun right there. And he says, Teach me hadith. And Shu'aba said, Lasta ahlan li dalik. You're not appropriate, worthy of being taught hadith. And so he gets agitated and he pulls out his dagger and he says, Teach me, tell me hadith. And the students start to move and Shu'aba tells him, It's okay, relax. And he narrates the hadith of the Prophet. If you have no shame, then do whatever it is you want. He gets it. He throws his dagger aside. He grabs his hands and cries and begs and apologizes. He goes home, packs his bag, changes. He's got alcohol at home. He throws it all away. Tells his mother, make some food. Some friends are going to come looking for me. Tell them the alcohol is gone and feed them. And then basically tell them that I'm gone. And he leaves Baghdad and he goes and he doesn't stop until he gets to Medina. And when he gets to Medina, he finds Imam Malik there. And then he spends the next 30 years studying with Imam Malik and becomes one of the most illustrious narrators of hadith. Do not underestimate yourself. I apologize for going over time. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.